In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we shall consider how to make a good confession. As you know, the very basics for any confession to be valid, it first of all must be entire. That is, every mortal sin committed since one's last good confession must be confessed in kind and number. What sort of sin it was, any important circumstances, and how often it was committed. For any time we intentionally conceal a mortal sin, it invalidates the entire confession, whether it be because we omit it entirely or because we describe it falsely, making it seem not so bad by knowingly omitting an essential detail. There is a big difference between I pushed my brother and I pushed my brother off a cliff. Now, sometimes we make unintentional omissions, especially if it has been a long time since our last confession. These omissions can arise from two very different causes. First, they can be the result of our own failure to examine our conscience properly. To make a good confession, we must make an honest effort to examine our conscience, which means taking not just a couple minutes, but setting aside a good space of time, using a good examination of conscience, asking the Holy Ghost for the light to see ourselves as God does, and calmly examining our actions to the best of our ability. The Roman Catechism states that we are not to examine our consciences with careless indifference or to be so negligent in recalling our sins as to seem as if unwilling to remember them. Should this have been the case, the confession must by all means be made over again. Other omissions in confessions, however, can simply be the result of an honest inability to remember. If, despite our attempts at examination, we do not recall a sin, or we do not recall exactly how many times we committed it, or having it in our mind as we enter the confessional and it flies out of there once we're in, and we can honestly not remember it, then we should be confident that God, who knows our contrition and knows all things, too forgives this sin through the same sacrament. And the confession thus need not be repeated. One should simply mention the forgotten sin in the next confession. Now, of course, the simple naming of one's sins to a priest is not sufficient. One must have true contrition for them. Real sorrow for having committed the sins because of how hateful they are in themselves and worthy of God's just punishments, but especially because they have offended the infinite God whom we ought to love above all things. This is different from the natural regret that a criminal might have at getting caught who is sorry not for his sin, but for the consequences inflicted upon him by others. Contrition, then, is true when we have the intention of making satisfaction for our sins through doing the penance imposed upon us by the priest and also by making any reparations that need to be made. Stolen goods must be returned. Injured reputations must be repaired. Insults apologized for, grudges forgiven. Enmities, so far as we are able, at least on our part, must be ended. What is also required for one to have true contrition is a purpose of amendment, and not just any purpose of amendment, but a firm purpose of amendment. 
We make many plans in this life of varying intensity. A man may intend to play a game of pickup soccer some afternoon, but if something else comes up, be it ever so small, which seems slightly more important, he will quickly abandon his plan. This is not a firm purpose. A man may make other, much more firm intentions. He promises to pick up his friend at the airport. It will take much more to derail that plan. Or he has a firm purpose of getting this or that job, acquiring this or that property, courting and marrying this or that young lady. The more firm his intention is, the more effort he will expend to accomplish it. Now, if men make so many firm purposes in their lives about so many worldly things of lesser importance, then we know they are quite capable of doing so in pursuit of eternal salvation. If you have a firm purpose of amendment, you will not only hate and avoid that sin which cost you the life of your soul, but also hate and avoid all occasions of it. If a man falls repeatedly into grave sin by means of his phone or computer, he cannot have any firm purpose of amendment if he takes no steps to prevent that sin in the future. To say, I'll keep doing everything the same, I'll just not sin like that again, is pure foolishness. Anyone who has a habit of mortal sin must have a very firm purpose. Again, not simply not to do that again, but to take all the means, all the extra steps he must take to rid himself of that habit, no matter what difficulties the plan entails. Someone who has cancer certainly wishes to be cured, but if he refuses to take the treatments the doctor prescribes because they are difficult and unpleasant, instead hoping he can just take an aspirin or something, then really he has no firm purpose of saving his own life. Listen to what St. Alphonsus Liguri has to say about repeated sins of impurity. Impurity is called an unceasing sin on account of the obstinacy which it induces. Some person addicted to this vice says, I always confess the sin, so much the worse. For since you always relapse into sin, these confessions serve to make you persevere in the sin. The fear of punishment is diminished by saying, I always confess the sin. Where are this sorrow and firm purpose of amendment when you always return to the vomit? If you had had these dispositions and had received sanctifying grace at your confessions, you should not have relapsed, or at least you should have abstained from a consider for a considerable time from relapsing. You have always fallen back into the sin in eight or ten days, and perhaps in a shorter time after confession. What sign is this? It is a sign that you were always in enmity with God. Thus far, St. Alphonsus. One must not be surprised then, let alone angered if, because of a failure to examine one's conscience well, or expressing no hatred for sin, no sorrow for it, no firm purpose of amendment, no plan to fix things, or a refusal to make reparations or to avoid the near occasions of sin, the confessor must either delay or withhold absolution. No less an expert in confession then St. John Vianney tells us that the Church herself has given laws 
which the priest is unable to set aside. The priest's duty is to apply these laws in the right way, and it is your duty not to murmur or complain if he finds it necessary to refuse or postpone absolution. If a priest refuses it to you, he says, it is because he has your real interest at heart and an ardent desire to save your soul. And you will comprehend this rightly at the day of judgment. Had he given it to you as you wished, he would have been damned. Thus far, St. John. In addition, it is a good habit to confess regularly and to confess venial sins. Though this is not so strictly required as confessing mortal sins, we should do so with the same honesty and purpose of amendment. All confessions should be simple, plain, sincere, prudent, modest, brief, and above all, humble. We should state our sins, even venial sins, plainly, giving any information necessary to make them intelligible to our confessor. We should be specific, not general or vague. St. Francis de Sales says, make no superfluous accusations such as these. I have not loved God as much as I ought. I have not prayed with as much devotion as I ought. I have not cherished my neighbor as I ought. I have not received the sacraments with as great reverence as I ought, etc., etc. For in saying this, you will say nothing that can make your confessor understand the state of your conscience, since all the saints in heaven and on earth might say the same thing if they were to come to confession. Examine then what particular reason you may have to make these accusations. And when you have discovered it, accuse yourself sincerely and distinctly. Thus far, St. Francis. Indeed, we should be thorough. As we must confess all mortal sins, so too if we wish to make the best use of regular confession. We should examine our conscience thoroughly for any and all venial sins. Even the saints fell into little sins of weakness. If we, who would be quick to say, we are not perfect? If we can only come up with one sin to name after a month has passed or even a week, this simply tells our confessor that we aren't examining our conscience well. It is not for lack of sins that we have so few to confess, but lack of awareness, humility, and effort. We would do well to remember, true of venial as well as of mortal, the advice of St. Ambrose. The devil keeps an account of your sins to charge you with them at the tribunal of Jesus Christ. Do you wish, he says, to prevent this accusation? Anticipate your accuser. Accuse yourself now to a confessor, and then no accuser shall appear against you at the judgment seat of God. We should be honest about our motives and any sins that contributed to the situation which comes to our mind first. Instead of merely saying, I was angry, we should say, I have held onto resentment against a certain person. I entertained many angry thoughts against him. I counted up his crimes in my mind. Then I spoke to him in anger and insulted him. And then after the fact, I was harsh with other people completely uninvolved. We must also honestly declare the relation we have to any persons involved, if it makes a difference, without, though, mentioning their names. I was rude, but to whom? 
For it is one thing to be rude to a stranger, another to be rude to a friend, another to be rude to a parent or a spouse or a priest. If we do so briefly, we may also benefit by acknowledging the consequences of our sins and explaining any remedies we intend to take to our confessor. But when we are giving these necessary details, necessary because they describe our sinful thoughts, words, and deeds, we should not give unnecessary details. And above all, we must never try to justify ourselves by describing other people's sins. The Roman Catechism states, the pride of some who seek by vain excuses to justify or extenuate their offenses is carefully to be repressed by the priest. If, for instance, a penitent confesses that he was wrought up to anger and immediately transfers the blame of the excitement to another, who he complains was the aggressor, he is to be reminded that such excuses are indications of a proud spirit. And if a man who either thinks lightly of or is unacquainted with the enormity of his sin, while they serve rather to aggravate than to extenuate his guilt. He who thus labors to justify his conduct seems to say that then only will he exercise patience when no one injures him, a disposition than which nothing can be more unworthy of a Christian. Thus far the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And so I cannot stress this enough. If we seek, however subtly, to justify our sins by confessing the sins of others against us, we inject pride into our confessions, which should be made with the greatest humility. Even if you come only to make a confession for venial sins, if you turn it into an exercise of self-justification, you are doing yourself much more harm than good. But when you make a good confession with true contrition, describing your sins and not those of others, expressing your sorrow for sin with a firm purpose of amendment, St. Francis de Sales says, you will also practice the virtues of humility, obedience, sincerity, charity, nay, in a word, in this one act of confession, you shall exercise more virtues than in any other whatsoever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.